Uh, this is the program on constitutional government, and our speaker today is Stephen Smith. Stephen Smith is going to speak on uh, the scramble toward Europe from Africa. It's going to be based on his most recent book, La Rue vers l'Europe, which is a young Africa en route to the old continent. Some of Africa to the migration from Africa to the old continent. And Stephen Smith is a professor at Duke, professor of the practice of African and African American studies at Duke University. And before that, he was an adjunct uh, lecturer at uh, at uh, John, Johns Hopkins in Washington at SAIS. He got his PhD in semiotics from the Free University in Berlin, and he studied um, anthropology at the Sorbonne. He was, uh, he said, uh, uh, before this, he was a journalist. He was a deputy editor of the Foreign Desk at Le Monde for five years, and the Africa editor, editor at Liberation for 12 years. And he'd been a, a roving correspondent in West and Central Africa for Reuters New, New Agency and Radio France. So and he's the author or co-author of 16 books on uh, country reports for the International Crisis Group, consultant for the United Nations and other international bodies. He's con widely contributed to many different uh, publications and he writes regularly for the London Review of Books, and also, it says here, has worked for the film industry and uh, as historical consultant and script writer. So, <laughs> so this, this is Stephen Smith. He's worked for the film industry. <laughs> That's right. So, uh, I, I mean, this is way beyond any professor, professorial talent. <laughs> Stephen Smith. Thank you so much. No. Um, now I'm embarrassed because I have to start with an apology. Um, Harvey uh, already invoked my French background. I mean, the time I spent in France. And now I forgot to bring the book. It's actually out in English. It came out in, in, the, in the summer. So it does yeah. exist as uh, uh, the scramble for Europe. And uh, you don't need to read it in French. I'm absolutely delighted to be with you, and thank you so much for coming. Uh, I'm delighted because I don't want to talk so much about the book. I actually want to share with you a few pages out of my notebook of all the things that I don't discuss in debates, because debates are this sort of perfumed fog that shot through with lightning, and you never dwell on the lightning because you're in, in, a, in an argument with people. And I thought this was the right, that's why I keep it as informal, if with your permission, as I may. Uh, I want to talk about the open questions and actually my own sort of unspoken thoughts and the conundrums and the puzzles that I have grappling with uh, what I call young Africa and with migration, but not only migration. Migration was the perspective that I used for Europe because that was the best way to share my portrait of young Africa with Europeans who may be preoccupied, at least care about the vicinity of 1.3 billion Africans and in 30 years, 2.4 billion Africans. So, uh, but I thought I could, uh, divulge in contraband uh, a little bit more about Africa because at the end of the day I'm not principally interested in migration more into uh, in, in Africa. All this to say that I will give you a thumbnail of my argument, my broader argument, and then I will speak about uh, my open questions with hopes that we together as permanent revisionists will have a debate and uh, discuss those and hopefully I will also change my opinions in the course of this discussion. So. First to say, I'm standing in the long and infamous tradition of white men discovering Africa. So the Africa that I discovered is young Africa. Um, that is a continent that has experienced unprecedented population growth in human history since the 1930s. In 1930, the population of Africa was 150 million people. And it's now, I already mentioned that, 1.3 billion. In 10 years, it'll be 10 times more in a century. And in 2050, 2.4 billion. This has never happened in any other part of the world, this sort of uh, demographic growth. Don't be afraid, I'm not going into a Malthusian uh, argument at all. I'm interested not in 
outright numbers, but in population age structure. 40% of the population of Africa is under the age of 15. And I don't expect you to imagine what that could mean. It means if you stand in the midst of a random crowd, half of the population is under the age of 40. That's the continental average. Uh, in Central Africa, in Central Africa, it would be closer to 50%. And in North Africa and South Africa, it is closer to 35%. But I'm just taking that as the average. Now, you have these, that means inter alia, uh, that every 18 years, half of the population is, quote unquote, renewed. That says something about the political horizon. Think about an infrastructure project, uh, a bigger project that would you know, necessitate 20 years of construction. Half of the population, the beneficiaries that are not yet born for this project. Um, the youthfulness of Africa is accentuated uh, by hyper rapid urbanization. Take the example of Nigeria. Nigeria's population since I was born in the mid 50s, 1950s, uh, the population increased five times. The population of the biggest city in Nigeria, Lagos, increased by a uh, multiplicative factor of 60, 50, uh, close to 60. So there were, when I was born, roughly 450,000 people living in Lagos. Today it's 23 million. It's the biggest city in, in, in Africa. And in Lagos, 60% of the population is under the age of uh, 15. Just for comparison, I don't expect you to, in a, in a deeper sense, to understand these figures. But uh, if you compare it to a relatively young European capital, uh, I take Paris for obvious reasons, 18% of the population in Paris is under the age of 15 by comparison to 60% in, in Lagos. So this is the the continent that I'm interested in. I pretend that is under acknowledged academically in the public discourse, that we haven't really thought about it. People know in general that you know, there's population growth, spectacular population growth in Africa. They may know that Africa is a very youthful population, but we don't think about young Africa uh, in, in all its consequences. And I will uh, speak to various aspects thereof Migration will be one of them, but in the book I dwell on young Africa on the move. And I'm not speaking here about outward migration exclusively. I think about the village, the, the movement of people from the village to the next provincial town, then to a big city, very often the capital city, then maybe to a regional uh, metropole, a uh, bigger city. You think of Johannesburg or uh, Lagos or Abidjan, Nairobi. And then uh, a proportion of the migrants uh, migrates outside of Africa for the moment, because this changes over time. Uh, out of 10, uh, from out of 10 uh, African migrants, seven stay in Africa, and only th uh, three of them leave uh, Africa. Half of them come to Europe, and the rest uh, disperses in the rest of the world. So uh, the question I'm asking is, do people move? They are on the move. You can think about that as the terraces of a fountain. So it uh, broadening uh, terraces of a fountain. People leave the village, rural exodus. We are familiar with that. And then all the down to outward migration. Why do people move? And uh, the, the short and I think reductionist answer is to say for economic reasons, for uh, it, reasons of disparity in income. Disparity in income, Sub-Saharan Africa, Europe is 1 to 20. That's enough reason to, to migrate. Uh, you can also migrate to a more prosperous country in Africa. Uh, one example would be Ivory Coast. Another one would be South Africa. Uh, but I don't think that is really fully addressing the question because I think most people leave uh, in a quest for emancipation without revolution. They don't want to break or sever ties, but at the same time they want to escape from the heft of, let's call it tradition in Africa. And tradition, my, the, the shortcut for that, at least in this talk, uh, needs to be uh, the principle of seniority and gerontocracy. The fact that there is a premium laid on age and elderly men hoard opportunities in Sub-Saharan Africa. And young people, and especially there's a gender bias to this, young women try to escape this 
uh, uh, gerontocracy. And that is the reason why people would leave their villages and go and live under the bridges of Lagos. Uh, Two thirds of all uh, cities in Africa are slums. So it is not as if moving from the village, you're going to a paradise. And I think uh, we also know that moving to Europe is not necessarily for the migrants the beginning of a, a prosperous and happy period. I will come back to that. So for me, migration is actually a sequence of false starts into a new life. And it is not an exodus, so you leave the village because the village is unbearable, or an invasion of the cities, or an invasion of Europe. It is rather an evasion in, in twice over. You evade the tutelary presence of the elders, the fact that you can't lead the life that you want to lead. Prosperity is part thereof, but it's only a part. And I think you also, it's an evasion in the sense that you will end up missing your home country, but you also miss the second home country or your new home in the sense that you miss a target. I know very few African migrants who actually at the end of the day say, I made the right decision, I'm 100% sure migration was the good idea. Very often they think it will be better for their children, but it is the, the, the general perception of migration being you touch American or European soil and uh, that's the end of it and it's a happy ending. It does not at least uh, fit with my experience with African migrants. So I think migration is that sequence of false departs and migrants make a break for freedom and that the quest for prosperity is only part of th thereof. Now obviously in the short time that I have, what does that mean? It means a lot of things and I won't talk about all of that. I will just give you quickly two examples because before I speak about all the questions, the question marks that I have in my own head and uh, you may look for answers more than question marks. So my, some of the answers for example would be in the realm of uh, government uh, which you are interested in. Uh, you see, we have a very harsh assessment of post-colonial governance in Africa. So usually uh, corruption and mismanagement are being presented as one of the reasons or a main reason for the negative balance sheet of post-colonial rule. If you factor in what I just said in a thumbnail about African demographics, I think we would have a very different assessment because what Alfred Sauvy called the demographic investments, which is funding the roads, the hospitals, the school, the universities, uh, all the infrastructure that you would need for population growth of the sort that I just described. Even if you were the World Bank and you would have the optimal resource allocation that you can think of, there was no way uh, independent Africa could have a good governance, could not end in failure. And we don't factor that in because we just don't think about young Africa. Just wanted to give you that example. It has a sort of subchapter. If you look at corruption from this point of view and you start or you give up on moralizing about corruption and you uh, bargain on understanding it, you would understand that under the demographic pressure that I just tried to uh, invoke, corruption is a rational choice. It is the rational choice of people who live on a market where there is overabundant demand and exiguous supply in the absence of a strong uh, control of a regulator, uh, a coercive regulator. It makes sense, even though everybody complains about corruption, it makes sense to buy into corruption because otherwise you will be the loser in a society under such heavy demographic pressure. I'm just uh, giving you examples. I could go into public health, talk about HIV or other things, or into education. I thought you were more interested in uh, gov uh, government, so i just give you a second example of uh, how this young Africa matters for our rereading of the African map. And here I would like to talk about democratization. There's, you know, we go into Africa almost as missionaries of, uh, of uh, democratization. Uh, in actuality, when you look at the chances for democratization, both the advent of democracy and the sustainability of democracy, you would have to factor in the youthfulness of Africa, which means that over half of the population is a priori excluded from the process, being under the age of 18. That's the starting point of democratization. And in my understanding, if we had a better 
uh, grasp of the realities of young Africa, we would start to discuss whether it wouldn't make sense to lower the age of uh, uh, the voting age. And this especially as youth is, or any age uh, category, is not just an age bracket. So uh, we, for lack of a better solution, we say age is between 18 and 25. Actually, the African Union defines age between 18 and 35 for a reason, because people do not graduate into adulthood. Many of the young Africans are actually failed adults. They can't move on, have a household, have a family, build a house. And so democratization taken seriously, and not the talk about empowering Africans to democratize, but uh, opening up the potential for democracy would mean draw more people into the democratic process. And youth in Africa, the sort of responsibilities that young people shoulder at ages that had nothing to do with uh, middle class America, uh, would make it, I think, a, a, a risk that people should take, that states could take, to lower the age of uh, uh, the voting age uh, to 16 or even 15. That's a debate that should take place, but it doesn't take place because uh, of the under acknowledgement of young Africa. So this is the part where I say things that I think I can defend. Now comes the part where my doubts start, but I want to start with three convenient lies. And I call them lies because we feign surprise even though we should know better. And the first uh, convenient light, uh, lie is that we see poverty as an enabling condition of migration. And I think it is as much a disabling condition as it is an enabling. It is first a disabling condition uh, because when you're really very poor, you don't migrate because of the cost of migration. You don't have the money. We all know that in principle. But we don't think, uh, especially if you look at the media-driven discourse, it is people leave Africa because the poorest of the poor run away from poverty and come to Europe and other parts of the world. Prosperity, both prosperity and poverty are in turn enablers and disablers <coughs> of um, <laughs> migration. You have to cross a threshold of prosperity so as to be able to have the roughly now, it depends obviously, obviously of the point of departure of your migration, you need $3,000 to get on your way to Europe. Not everybody has that in countries where the per capita income is roughly, sub-Saharan Africa, $2,000. So it means if you, as an American, look at the problem, you would need something like sixty dollars to $80,000 put aside before you can actually start to migrate. That's the equivalent. And so we look at people who migrate to Europe as the poorest of the poorest, and they are actually the emerging middle class in Africa. There's roughly 150 million people nowadays in Africa, people who earn between $5 and $20. That's the definition, for lack of a better one, of the emerging African middle class. And the number, 150 million, will quadruple over the next 30 years. This is the shape of things to come. And uh, we, we need to understand that uh, poverty is for quite some time a disabler of migration. And that means, and brings me to my second point, development aid, when successful, will be incentivizing or subsidizing migration. We all should know that. It's not something that I found out and then sort of uh, put into, into writing. But in all the public debates that I had over the past two years since the, uh, the book came out in different languages, uh, people are surprised, or I would say feign to be su feign, uh, their surprise, because uh, they hear all day long politicians say, let us give development aid to, in our case, uh, Central America, or in the European case, to Sub-Saharan Africa. This will stabilize uh, uh, migration. It will not. In the in, in, in first period, it will accelerate, because uh, more people will be uplifted out of that poverty that is a disabler uh, of migration. and. Only at the end, I mean, at the end of the migratory process, people will actually be in a position where they uh, will stay behind because the prosperity is sufficient for them to resist the temptation of migration. Now, uh, this leads me to re uh, thinking about our the balkanization of our mind when we know one thing on the one side and we 
discard it when we think about other things. Development aid is a little bit a threat through that because development aid, development is a word that came up in the 1930s. It's not a Cold War term. It is actually a colonial term, colonial development. And the French version was mise en valeur de, de, of the colonies. And that's, again, in the 1930s, precisely when the demographic uh, uh, growth started in earnest in, in Africa. And the second, uh, we know development aid much better out of the context uh, in the, in the co uh, Cold War, where I think it was something very different from that initial attempt, because it was a sort of geopolitical rent that was given to allies, local allies. Uh, so... Uh, it had little to do with development. And my fear today is that it will turn, it's a little bit like Vishnu in different avatars, uh, it, will turn, it will be turned into a migratory rent. Uh, the global north will pay money to countries in the global south so they would police their population and prevent them from migrating. And that's an important point. Obviously, you can think about the wall of money that Europe is building around the southern rim of Europe, so in the Sahel and in North Africa. But you can also think uh, that's a real sort of uh, a, a modern limey's, uh, but uh, a wall of money. But you can also think about the wall to court uh, of, of uh, President Trump, who thinks that the Mexicans will pay for this, uh, uh, preventing the barbarians to come to the empire. What we don't think about, because I, th I believe, or my impression is that the left as, as well as the right underestimate, if not deny, African agency. There's a lack of acknowledgement that there is an opportunity and not a very good one for African states in this. They can, in actuality, pardon the uh, flippant expression, but they can double dip because they can get the migratory rent for helping to police the exodus of their population, but at the same time, they also get the remittances. So. There is, uh, from the point of view of an African government, you have the pressure of your population. Many people would like to leave. On average, to the best of our knowledge, 40% of adults, if given a chance, would like to migrate. Again, bear in mind, migrating may mean go to the neighboring country rather than go to the outside world. And uh, so as, a, as an African government, you're under the pressure of your population. At the same time, you're under the pressure of the European Union trying to, uh, to bring about a sort of forward defense against uh, migration. And I think there is a third dimension to that from uh, the standpoint of authoritarian regimes because you're actually exporting the strivers, the very people who could hold you accountable uh, in, in your country because this is the middle class, the only people who have the time and the, and the wherewithal to uh, get engaged in anything that uh, regards uh, the community, the national community. So in a way, it's the Machiavellian thing of uh, chopping off the cops that you actually let people out of the country and this, these strivers, this middle class, uh, migrate to, uh, uh, to Europe or other parts of the world. Now, the third lie that I want to, uh, lie is a harsh word, is, and again, I pardon, uh, pardon me for the, for the uh, language, the title would be, it's not the economy stupid. Uh, we very often believe in, a, in an economic determinism as a push factor for migration, but also that it is an economic determinism to accept migrants into Europe or other parts of the world. And I think this is just simply not true, uh, true. and again, a result of the balkanization of our mind in the sense that we know that um, there is no, from all we know, from all the studies that we know, no economic gain or loss that is demonstrable, especially when you think about the negative externalities that are socialized while the profits are privatized. And there is no demographic necessity when you think about the longevity in European countries. I'm sitting next to someone who's teaching at uh, the young age of 87 or 88. Uh, there, is a, there are many ways you could, you, you, it is not the transplantation of uh, people. I mean, even if you accept morally the idea of uh, sort of, uh, uh, you would have retirement fodder coming out of Africa for Europe, even if you accepted that idea. It is impossible to think that you would transplant 
call it with Robert Musil, uh, a, a man without qualities by another man without qualities. The, the social cost of integrating people is tremendous and in, in, in the idea of uh, it is the economy that drives the process or it's demographic necessity, I would uh, think that we are lopsided in our uh, assessment. Europe doesn't need to rejuvenate and in the knowledge e economy that we pretend is coming, uh, gener generally uh, undereducated or a low-skilled uh, workforce is not exactly what you need when 20% of, of the Mediterranean countries in Europe, 20% of the youth in Mediterranean countries is uh, out of job. Now, this is uh, where I thought uh, I have still some ground under my feet and then I have a few questions that I would just like to put out and discuss with you. First of all, at the end of several years working about this, uh, these questions, I, I'm left to wonder what actually migration is. And I'm saying this by comparison to diffusion of population. Uh, people moving have been moving uh, throughout history, obviously, and it is repeated very often. Migration is as old as mankind, but is the migration of the past the migration of the present? I, I have my doubts about that. Uh, are the Bantu migrations comparable with the mig migrations today? Or if you look at massive demographic uh, uh, disruption, uh, uprooting of people, I think about the Huguenots, for example, when they got in 1681 uh, uh, sanctuary in Great Britain, uh, and 50,000 moved to Great Britain. 50,000 uh, people moving to Great Britain, that is 10 weeks of migration in Great Britain today. When you think about the results of the Huguenots going to Great Britain, can we actually compare these migrations or do we need a new term for uh, the current contemporary uh, uh, phenomenon of migration? That's one of the questions that I have. And then the second one at home, in front of my desk, I have a sticker that someone gave to me in Paris. It says, we are all migrants. And it is meant to be an invitation for solidarity. Uh, and it's very welcome as such. But each day when I look at the sticker, we are all migrants, I start wondering, isn't that true in a deeper sense? Whether you move and you leave your country and you go to another country or you stay put, you are a migrant because in this world, at the pace at which it changes, the person who moves get into an entirely different context, but the person who stays put may also find himself or herself in a neighborhood that has substantially changed over a short period of time. I'm not going to push that. I see the difference between a, a migrant, uh, an active and a passive migrant. I was wondering about whether one couldn't say in analogy to an expression that you're all familiar with, whether there is a roving migrant and a stationary migrant. Uh, that's one possibility. And as uh, Mulay Hisham is here, I, I just think about, uh, I, I'm also, I have a doubt about how idealistic the idea is of a globally shared condition. And I remember uh, uh, a, a situation in the mid 60s when General Ufkir, who would eventually kill uh, Ben Barka, the uh, leftist firebrand of uh, Moroccan uh, politics, they were discussing about the pace of uh, progress. And Ben Barka would, you know, plead the a view of rapid emancipation of the masses and perhaps socialism. And uh, General Ufkir showed him a picture, a photograph, of the king riding out of the palace on the day of Baya of the allegiance and uh, showed him a small detail. And there was a fella, there was a peasant, uh, collecting the manure, the droppings of the royal horse. And he said, this is the pace of change. And you have to be very careful. Don't un, uh, overestimate the, uh, the, the, the speed of change. And I think uh, what we have experienced since 2015, the banner year not of migration but of a refugee crisis, is that some identities, I don't know what to call them, national identities, nativism, uh, has shown probably much more resilient than people would have thought before. And I ask myself whether cosmopolitanism uh, can become a mass condition anytime soon, and I have no answer to that. Another puzzle uh, in my, in my uh, engagement with the material is the link between border control and welfare state. 
uh, if you are in a more, and that's also a, a caricature, but a more Hobson environment, there is a self-regulation. So in a country like the United States, you know you come to the United States, either you go under or you have to go away or you succeed. In a country like Nigeria, you don't need border control because people from West Africa come to Nigeria, but they leave if they can't make it. But in another environment, and I take here as the extreme example, Europe, Europe is 7% of the world population. They spend half of the amount of money that is spent on, uh, in this world on Social Security. 7% of the population, every other dollar that is spent in the world on Social Security is, spelled, uh, is spent in this territory. Now, think about the vicinity of 1.3 billion Africans now, 2.4 billion in 30 years, and the fact that next door, 14 kilometers across the Detroit of Gibraltar, uh, there would be the citadel of social security. If I were an African thinking about my family, my, my, my children, looking for good and cheap education, for good health care, et cetera, that's the one thing I would do. I would try to get to Europe, of course. But the question for Europe is, you know, how do you reconcile border control in a welfare state environment? And the only response that is offered and that I don't think is a viable and an acceptable one is Fortress Europe that is shutting it down and making sure that people can't come in there. So I'm thinking about what does it actually mean? Does the welfare state need to evolve towards a, a simple Leviathan? Or uh, what, what is the answer to the question, how do you reconcile border control and uh, an environment of welfare of social security? A very quick in passing, uh, also to respect the time limit, limits, I, am, I didn't work at all about uh, on North Africa. I just saw naively North Africa as a zone of transit, and that is a, very, that is a shortcoming. Uh, of, of course, you have this forward defense in the Sahel in North Africa. We all know about Libya and what the Italians negotiated. So roughly between 500,000 and a million migrants would get stuck there. But um, I didn't pay enough attention to strategies like Algeria, uh, policing the southern border for Europe. What do, they, what do they get in exchange? And the most interesting, so these would be these, uh, you know, uh, states, police states along the Limes, if I want to call it that way, to again make this uh, outrageous uh, comparison with the barbarians and the empire. But there's one example that really intrigues me, that's Morocco, where the king decided, and so it's top down, he decided that he would not only police the European border and get the migratory rent for it, but he would also turn his country in the, into the United States of Sub-Saharan Africa in a way. And he said, we need to welcome migrants, integrate them, and for the time being, this is a top-down experience. I don't know whether there will be popular backlash against that, and that's uh, a discussion that I think would be interesting, but there is an experiment going on, and it is uh, thought through because Morocco is projecting its banking system, uh, even its religious teachers, uh, mobile telephony into sub-Saharan Africa, building a sub-Saharan African economic empire with, against the background of welcoming people who usually leave to get to Europe but may get stuck and productively stuck in Morocco. And so this is an ongoing experiment. I wanted to share this with you as an open question. Now I will jump to my conclusion because I have to. I was about to speak about uh, how incommensurable the world has become depending on which part you're living in, but I skipped that section. Finally, I'm thinking about the return of the caravels. Uh, as you probably, The Return of the Caravels is the name of, a, or the title of a novel by Antonio Lobo Antunes, uh, the Portuguese writer, and it's a, you know, a fantastical story. But the idea is that these Latin rigged ships, uh, which were invented in the 15th century and were the first ships that allowed us to sail against the wind and to sail along the western west coast of Africa against the trade winds. And that's the beginning of the exploration of the African coastline and then later on of Africa. His, that was a novel published in 1988, um, 
he thinks about the return of the caravels, what comes back. And here, don't get me wrong, I'm not talking about a sort of uh, a reconquista or anything warlike or uh, seeing this as revenge colonialism. Or, but what is the cargo that comes back with the return of the caravels? And he explores that from a literary point of view. I find it extremely interesting because all the things that Europe, in a way, exported since the has exported since the uh, 15th century and which took hold and was commingled with African agency will come back inter alia essentialism and in some instances racialism. And I see the, the response of the Europeans to racial thinking, essentialist thinking that comes back from Africa and if you want to, you can say it is of European origin. I don't know whether that matters all that much. But it comes back and it is actually welcomed in a way because in, in an attempt to atone for, for past uh, crimes, the crime of uh, uh, colonialism. And so we have this moment where the worst of, of Europe's past comes back sometimes through migration and you end up wondering whether, uh, you, you know, I, I think of the warning of Nietzsche about the mimesis, the fatal mimesis of enmity. When you're fighting monsters, you need to be beware of the fact that if you really suss out in a fight that is about life and death, you will fight, uh, you will try to find out, suss out the, the next move of your enemy. So when you're fighting monsters, beware that you don't ap end up resembling the monster that you try to fight. And in many cases, I think our attempt to fight racism uh, inevitably by anti-racism uh, is uh, part of that mimesis of enmity that could end up turning us or have monstrous results uh, for, for the reasons that I just tried to explain. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Oh, questions. Thank you for talk. Um, you didn't say anything about birth rates, which I assume must be a large explanatory part of the picture um, you're describing, young Africa. Um, I think I've seen a statistic that, I'm sure you know better, that the sub-Saharan sub Africa, the fertility is, is over five children per wom woman at this point, and obviously in most of the world it's come down to, you know, the, in the last couple of generations dramatically. That doesn't seem to be coming down in Africa, is that, is that the significant the chief cause in a way of what you're describing and why do you think Africa is different that way, is it just that it's still poor or, or what? Um, very quickly, there is a lot of disparity in fertility rates. Um, you are almost at 2.1, which is the uh, uh, stabilization in North Africa in a country like Morocco, and there's a lot of disparity in Africa. Fertility is, we, Africa is in the demographic transition, and in Sub-Saharan Africa it is not, they are not in the final stages of, so, uh, you know, you move in a simple way of explaining, you move from big families with short lives to small families with long Long lives, and in sub-Saharan Africa, it's sometimes even within a country contradictory tendencies. So you would have trends in northern Nigeria, which is mainly uh, Muslim. Uh, you would have still an increase in fertility, and in southern Nigeria, you would have a decrease. Uh, globally, um, contraception is about a quarter of uh, African women on, on, on average, on continental average, have access to contraception. And some countries, but only some, especially in the Sahel region, have uh, a fertility rates of uh, five to six uh, children uh, per, uh, per woman in, in age of procreation. So it's a very confusing picture in a way. The short way of answering a question is even to, if tomorrow there were an acceleration because some demographers even uh, discussed the possibility that Africa may break out of the universal scheme of uh, demographic transition. I don't believe that. I think uh, it, it will follow the, the, the model of the rest of the world uh, in a different way because it's under different conditions. But even if tomorrow fertility dropped significantly in Africa, uh, nothing would change given my time horizon being 2050 because the people who will be born by 2050, their parents are already uh, among us, and so demographic changes are so slow that would affect the second half of this century. I abstain from 
uh, using material for the second half of the century. If you do so and you just use the UN figures, just to give you an, also an impression, I didn't want to dwell over much on that, uh, of the sort of population growth from today on in UN projections for the end of the century, from today on three, of three out of four people that, are, that will be born from now on until the end of the century will be born south of the Sahara. Yes. Yes. Uh, prior to 1960, Western, the Western Euro European countries had a major influence in Africa. Now, could you compare the influence with China and Africa today? How much influence does China have in the Africans? Um, I, I'm very uh, thankful for the question. I'm thankful for all questions, but I'm specifically thankful for that, so this one because it allows me to say that uh, influence, I, you know, we have probably had speakers here to address the question of the global influence of China in Africa. Uh, was the 83rd uh, trading partner in 97, is the first since 2005, et cetera, et cetera. You've gone over that uh, many times, I guess. Uh, but the very big difference is China doesn't come to Africa with a mission to civilize. They come for interests like all other players. Uh, they are perhaps sometimes a little bit more open about their interests uh, than, than uh, Western powers and especially former colonial powers, uh, but they do not interfere in questions and so, nor has the West, by the way. It seems to be, and quite understandably, a very delicate issue to, in, especially in the euphoria of uh, in accession to independence, to start a discourse about how counterproductive it would be to have these high fertility rates. No one went, you know, you have a lot of conditionality, but no conditionality on uh, uh, family planning, I'm obviously not talking about anything coercive, but uh, speaking about, uh, yeah, that uh, it is difficult to get out of poverty when you have this sort of fertility rates, that was not addressed uh, until very, very recently and only in a very few, uh, in a small number of African countries, and China would not interfere in anything of that. So whatever leverage they have, and I also think about China not so exclusively as a state actor. There's a million Chinese, to the best of our knowledge, living in Africa. Many of them are private. So we think about China as, you know, these uh, fenced-in communities and all the state. Any village where you go to today in Africa, you would find a Chinese married to an African, et cetera. So uh, we have, a, there are quite a few cliches out there about China. Uh, many people from China leave China because they want to emancipate, uh, you know, become prosperous in Africa and then may, maybe go on to the United States, et cetera. So it's not just a state strategy. It's really a demographic thing also uh, of, of, of private Chinese people, you know, real, real migrants on their own and with their own agenda. Sir. Yes. Uh, could, you, could you say something about, uh, you know, the education systems in these... Uh in these uh, in these countries, are they uh, performing? Are they uh, equipping this youth with uh, with the right tools to uh, for economic growth and to, as you use your term, to be enablers, to be enabled? And uh, what, what's the trend? What's the general trend? I, uh, th this will be a terrible summary, and if any of my students hear me say that, I will be. Uh, uh, a former professor, but uh, the, the, the general t uh, trends, uh, the, I mean, the, the one trend is privatization of education all over Africa, even in South Africa. So most uh, education is, uh, is being de facto or, or de jure legally privatized. That's the first thing. And the quality of education, if you look at it in general and compare with the rest of the world, uh, does not allow us to buy into the current uh, leitmotif of, uh, about Africa rising. You have exceptions, and, but most people send their children uh, abroad. And I mean, Africa, the African elite, is living in levitation to their reality. I mean, most people go for even mid-income mid, mid functionaries are flown abroad for medical, uh, for medical, uh, medical uh, treatment. And so uh, the elite uh, education takes place in Europe and in, in Morocco, for example. Quite a few uh, Sub-Saharan Africans send their children to Morocco. Uh, but Sub-Saharan African education is not a prep 
school for the knowledge economy. That's something that you can say without risk of uh, misrepresenting the reality. Goodness. And in many instances, it's actually quite dramatic because uh, you, you have situations where uh, <coughs> problems like uh, uh, the abuse of uh, authority in, in the classroom, uh, sleeping for grades uh, with, with professors. I mean, if I really go into, into the experiential realm, it's depressing. Yes, Dan. Thanks uh, for the talk. I enjoyed it very much. Uh, you laid out a number of very compelling lies that the European mind believes about young Africa today. And you often refer to the balkanization of the mind that allowed them to believe such lies. I wonder if you could share with us some of your thoughts about, as to the causes of such balkanization. Why the bad faith? Um, I, I don't lay claim to anything original here because I think it's just cognitive dissonances. And uh, I, I mean, Orwell has his own word for it. I use balkanization. Uh, we all do that. We know something in one part of our brains and we don't. Uh, try to reconcile it with uh, something else. I think uh, the, I, I take the example of development aid. I'm really stunned to see how you can use and use again and use again the argument that uh, giving development aid, I'm, I'm even not uh, bracketing out whether development aid does deliver development. That's entirely different. There can be a pregnant pause for cynicism. But uh, in, 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 regardless of that, if it did, uh, logically, it would lead to uplifting people, lifting people out of poverty and allowing for them to migrate. And this we know academically. And most, uh, at the beginning, much of the reaction to my book was, oh, he, this is a revelation. I, I had to say, I'm sorry, I would like to lay claim to it. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's been known since the 1980s, and I'm just uh, repeating what, uh, what other people said. But the public discourse, we were so desperate, at least the Europeans are so desperate to find... Just one word, if I may. Our situation in the United States is very different. You know the discourse about mig uh, migration here, but we are 300 million, 330 million Americans, and our numerical relationship to Latin America, not only Mexico, is one to two, and in 50 years will still be one to two, if you include Canada, et cetera. So, this is not the sort of migratory pressure that Europe will face. Europe is one to two now and will be one to five in 30 years. And out of the five, three will be under the age of 15 uh, on the African side. And the uh, Europeans, the five Europeans, statistically will be above 50. So this is really very different. Uh, and we already know what migration means in the United States. But for, for uh, uh, Europe, it means much more. So each time... Uh, you speak to people, they're, they're desperate for a solution. And uh, I, I'm ashamed to say so, but I, I think there is no other solution than muddling through over the next two, three generations. You can't have a European fortress uh, for all also ethical reasons. It's impossible. You can't allow everybody to come in. So you have to somehow muddle through. And the Africanization of uh, Europe that I could speak to, which is an ongoing process and not necessarily a, a dramatic one. So far, it, it's just a process. Uh, but, you know, you had 15,000 uh, uh, sub-Saharan Africans in France when I was born. Now you have 2 million. That's a tremendous change. And so people that that, uh, you know, uh, is a, a field of tension is quite understandable. And so p people uh, look for some solution and they say you've been working on that so what shall we do and i say you have to muddle through and then they think okay this guy really uh, not very serious uh, but i mean the countries like spain do precisely that and so far it has worked it cannot be ideal but it has worked better than any of these silver bullets that represent and i think our desire to find a, a, like individuals the collective desire of finding a response development aid sounds good it doesn't sound like shut the borders down and shoot at people, etc. And so people cling to that, even though if you g gave it a second thought, it doesn't hang together. The answer they'd like to be true. Yes. That's a concise way of saying it. Yeah. Catherine. Um, could you say a bit more about the general, the, what you think are the most worrisome consequences in general of the um, upcoming population explosion in Africa by 2050? Um, I mean, is it, you know, aside, in addition to migration in general, um, just 
you know, it, is the Earth even going to be able to sustain that many people? And um, you know, what are what are the most worrisome things in your mind? And then, um, do you think that there would be any? What about instead of development aid, trying to fund low cost birth control or disperse birth control in North Africa by Western countries? That's a huge question. Um, the first, uh, I have strenuously avoided um, speaking about explosion or invasion or that. I'm, I'm not, uh, I, I fully understand, given the figures that I present, that you would talk about that. But I think, per se, uh, Africa is historically underpopulated, and even now it is uh, it is not overpopulated unless you look at the resources. So you, it depends on how you look at things. But I try to avoid explosion because if I had, even in personal terms, terms, if I had a choice between living in youthful Africa and living in, let's say, uh, Italy, or Italy is a very bad example. I would love to live in Italy. But let's say, uh, take Japan. I mean, per se, youth or the abundance of youth is not a threat. I'm not uh, waking up at night and think about the testosterone full uh, young male that will run to Europe or whatever. That's not my mindset. So, but you're obviously right. Right now, out of the 1.3 billion people, roughly 400 million are malnourished. And that's really severe. It's not just not eating enough. It means that people grow up, uh, children grow up, and they will have deficiencies, etc. So it's a very serious issue, which, was, which is eclipsed by the new leitmotif over the last 10 years of Africa rising, which is comes in succession to doom and gloom of the 1990s when you could only see a child soldier and HIV. And that was untrue, and now it's untrue. So we always walk on one leg. You know, we forget the other half. And what we forget is people are already starving to death or are undernourished, or life expectancy in some countries is lower than 50 years, all that. That will not get any better you know, with this sort of population uh, growth. 23 million uh, people in Lagos. Uh, I would like to go on a collective tour through Lagos. It, it, yeah, it, it, is, it is a sight to see. It is uh, something that we can't even really fathom what it means to live on $2 a day. We read it, but what does that actually mean? How do you get up in the morning and you go around the clock allocating $2, $2 for a family? Uh, how do you do that? So we are talking about things that we don't understand. And this will uh, become even worse. I'll give you an another example, and I don't blame any side, but the, the emotion that the Europeans had about crossing, or still have, about crossing the Mediterranean, and how the Mediterranean, their Mare Nostrum, would turn into a mass grave. And you look at it from the African perspective. The statistics, the facts are that in 2015, the banner year of migration, a million people across the Mediterranean, the chance of uh, perishing in the Mediterranean was 0.4%. Uh, from a European point of view, with the picture of uh, the young Turkish boy and all that, lots of emotion. From an African point of view, you get aboard any skiff uh, if the chance is less than one out of 100. That's taking a bus ride in, 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 in the Congo. The, the, the risk in 2015 was four times higher for a woman, any woman, to give birth to a child in South Sudan was four times higher. So this disparity, that was the section that I left out. We, we have no common measure on any longer. We communicate in real time, but the messages are garbled because we live in totally different worlds. And, and so you have this disparity. Now, if I answer your question from a European or a Western point of view, it will sound very dramatic. From an African point of view, it will be dramatic as well, but it's a little bit like life will go on and somehow we will get through. Uh, and I, I don't really know on which leg I would like to walk uh, today. Yes, please. Hi, um, so thank you very much for your remarks. I'm much more familiar with patterns of Chinese immigration to America through some of my reading. And I, I guess the one thing that, that I think very much resonated, or one of the things that you said, among others that was quite resonating was the idea of is migration today what it was in the past and and the way that i would one way i think of looking at that difference is reversibility so if you came mm -hmm. from china from southern china to be a, a worker you know whether it's a railroad or restaurants or whatever in the late 1800s it was essentially almost irreversible right you would be here you might barely get a letter home once a year or yeah and then the likelihood that you would like commuting certainly wasn't possible and now here you know we have 
all these graduate students and people coming from China, but it's a direct 11 hour flight from Boston to Beijing, right? Like they, it, it, it almost seems like migration or immigration or any of that, does it really, really capture what's going on? Because people don't, you know, they come for a few years, I'll get an education, I'll go back, I'll start a business, oh, I'll send my kid, I, and there, there, there doesn't seem to be a unidirectional thing. It's almost like a time scale of residence has gone from decades to months or whatever on average. And I, I wonder, does that, how does that play with much fewer resources in Africa when you know you can't do that when you're 12 years old. So I was wondering if your thoughts on on sort of changes in transportation and economics, and, and how we see physical human movement. With your permission, I, I forgot a little aspect in response to your question. Um, I think one of the perhaps something more positive to say about the challenges of the future is uh, when I refer to the failed adulthood, you can ease the the the, the, the the transition out of uh, youth into adulthood, the informal economy does precisely that. More people get jobs because there are not enough, enough jobs available in the formal economy, but you could also uh, reverse sort of the argument. Um, the Rwandan government, very efficient, sometimes over-efficient, um, they edicted rules for how you can construct in, in Kigali. And it was so counterproductive <coughs> that they had to drop it. It was good good policy, but young people don't have the money to buy this uh, to build this sort of houses. And so what you need to do is lower the threshold for people to actually move ahead into adulthood. And adulthood is not an age bracket. It is a social situation. A girl, uh, a mother of 17 is much older than 17 for the responsibility. So you have, there is possibility to a possibility to turn the overabundance of, of young people who do, are basically sitting in a waiting room to bring them over into some form of adulthood that would be a little bit the equivalent of the informal economy. Nothing will be ideal, but there is a there is a margin of you know of what how you can arrange things in a, in a way. Again, this is my powerless uh, muddle through attempt. Now, with regard to what you said, it is really interesting to see that, and this is not north against south, the, the privileged travel and the underprivileged migrate. That's the, you, I you, can quote you on that. Yes. Um, that, that, that's, uh, and so when you can go and come back, et cetera, and, but then if you think it, uh, I mean, if you try to continue that thought, uh, you may also think about the fact that you, we could come back to forms of uh, Gastarbeiter, guest workers. Uh, um, I, I, I am in discussion with various uh, governments. I, I'm not shy of engaging with politicians as long as I don't have a link of dependency. And especially the German government is thinking very much about the fact, why would we not secure access to Europe? but also make it more conditional. It would be individuals. They would come for three years, let's say. Uh, they would have, uh, uh, you know, acquire an experience, also a professional one, and would go back to their country and thus allowing someone else to come. It would not be migration in the sense that you bring up your children. It would really be, and that also acknowledges the fact which we very often for, you know, good intentions overlook the net loss for Africa. This, these are the most dynamic people. Somehow, they need to go back. And we all think of the heroic migrant, the one who overcomes the obstacles to come to whatever promised land. And we don't think about the opportunist who is actually leaving countries like Senegal or Ghana or Ivory Coast, all these threshold countries, uh, you know, just crossing, you know, forgetting about the opportunity of these countries actually to fulfill the hope that we place in, in Africa, because it would be rather these countries than Niger or Burkina Faso or Chad, you see. And so uh, the, 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 the migrant, here again, we should see both sides, the heroic migrant, but also the opportunistic migrant. Ask the question, who is right? The, the person who leaves in hopes for better life chances, not that I can't understand that, or is it the other person who says, I stay in Senegal because I think uh, somehow we have to get Senegal going in, in, in very easy language. And, but is uh, that even a really a dichotomy? So the reason I would say that is a lot of, say, Chinese people, they come, they settle, their kids, like some of my American-born classmates go back to China to do business because that's where the opportunity is for three years, and they come back here. I mean, it just seems like... But I think that's a very different world by comparison to, uh, to the African migration, and partly that is also because now... Uh, 
um, there is no more the fluidity of that circulatory. Uh, there was a post-colonial privilege in France, for example, for former French colonies. You didn't need a visa until 86. So everybody could come and obviously you could overstay your welcome, no problem. And now, th but at the time people would go back when they didn't have work because there was no problem to come back again to you. But that's just not for an African. Once you reach these promised lands, yeah, you, at, you at don't go point, back. Not, yes, yes. Back. And so that's quite different. So they stick it out and like they do in Lagos, I mean, they're <laughs> literally in the water under the bridge, but they don't go back to the village because it means shame, it means going back to the no. predictable, it means the end of the adventure. It's not only about prosperity, it's also about pride and uh, you know, it's the lottery mentality, I will make it. Very similar to our American dream. Statistically, the American dream is a lie, but, uh, <laughs> but you know, it keeps us going, it gives us dynamism. Thank you. Anna. Um, Stephen, could you explain a little how um, these orderly forms of migration, like uh, circular migration, for instance, um, how that's even possible without there being a fortress Europe? Because as long as you can't control, I mean, so if the, one of the contested issues or the hot button issues in Germany is expulsions, right? It's basically impossible to expel people, even to countries that you call the money belt, like Tunisia and Morocco. I'm not sure it has changed much. But last that I've heard, they don't take them back, and um, some German parties don't agree to certain countries being safe. But even if um, the resources that it would take to expel people, you know, the pilots, the police, the whatever, um, it doesn't seem to be there. So, and then and there was recently another case where a convicted and expelled clan member, a Lebanese clan member, you know, very high-level criminal, made it back all the way to Germany and applied for asylum again. Um, and if, if these cases can't be, you know, how would this be possible to suppress this without a fortress Europe and how can you, can you have regula regulations um, without that being basically the foundation? I acknowledge the, the problem fully, especially as the expression in many North African sub-Saharan countries is to burn the borders. And the first act of burning the borders is you burn your uh, identity papers to make sure that you can't be expelled because, you know, and the countries don't want to take you back, etc. I think in France, it was 1% of the people who legally should be expelled who were expelled, and it's perhaps the state's five or six years ago, it may be up to five year, uh, five percent now, but it is insignificant. Yes. So that, that's a problem. It's also a question, and that's, uh, you know, that's due, uh, due process. Uh, people have the right to object, and then you go through the motions, etc. So it's very, very difficult. But the idea of the circulator, uh, circulator migration is precisely burden sharing when it comes to border control. So it would be an issue between uh, African countries and European countries, and you, uh, you draw them into it, and you draw into that responsibility for European borders, for shared borders, not only the states, but also, also the civic societies. Just to, very briefly, we think about migration as being a net benefit for Africa, but in actuality, it's a source of inequality. There's not a village or a neighborhood in Africa where you wouldn't have the divide between those who have someone abroad and get the remittances, which is free money, which is not investment. It is like, you know, it's not free money for those who earn it, but it's free money for those who receive it. And so, uh, in a neighborhood, the social envy is exacerbated by the fact that this family has someone abroad and hence can build a, a house or something, and we can't because we haven't, and so this incentivizes further, and it is a source of division and of, uh, uh, of problems. And people are actually despised for migrating. Uh, there are various names for people, uh, also in North Africa, when they come back on holiday in, in, in the summer, uh, they are called names at home because they, Sud chez nous, chez vous, and all sorts of uh, names that they are being called because they are hanging in between. Uh, they, they are no longer really belonging to their home country, and they sometimes get the sense that they are not fully belonging to their second uh, home. And, and so all these tensions, uh, if you factor that in, the civic society, uh, Africans, uh, the middle class we are talking about, they have also an interest in 
the possibility of people rotating through that system. It is done in a more unpleasant way in some of the countries in the Arab Peninsula, where you arrive and you have to, uh, you know, uh, hand over your passport and you get it only, you know from the beginning you will be there two years and there won't be any extension and people accept that. It's a contractual thing. And so if you know that if your compatriot comes back and it's done officially, so you know people are coming and then they need to go back for someone else to be able, let's say, from Senegal to, to, to go to Europe, I think there is a chance. Of course, people will fall in love and people will uh, do all sorts, of, but then they need to ask for special permission to, 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 to stay. Life will be as contradictory as it always is, but you could set up a system, I think, that would allow for people to register, like there's already a, U a EU agency in Agadez at the at sort of the portal to the desert in Niger, you could have uh, in the European embassies uh, an administration where people legally ask for a three-year stay in Europe. And they accept from the beginning the idea that they go without their families, that they acquire uh, a professional experience and come back for someone else to take their place. I don't know. I hope it is not uh, uh, wishful thinking. Now, the, the, the one thing that uh, you also allude to is the criminalization of uh, migration. Uh, and this is also under acknowledged because uh, sometimes for cynical reasons or compassion, we overlook the fact that this is big business. The entire tourism industry of Niger, uh, all the tourism seems not very important to us, but was very important for Niger. Uh, all the tourism uh, across the Sahara, coming from Algeria and down uh, Taman Rasset and then uh, into Niger, all the buses, the, the houses, the hostels and the hotels have been converted into uh, migrant infrastructure. And, and it's human trafficking and it's about prostitution. It's about, and all this is under acknowledged as is the fact that obviously when you say, I can save you in the, in the Mediterranean, if only you, uh, through a, tele a satellite telephone you give me your coordinates, I will come and rescue you. Uh, as a migrant, I think, okay, I have my satellite telephone. Uh, I hope this is true, and I see this boat is, you know, it's not seaworthy, but I still embark because I think in, in case something happens, I can call someone. And so there is a humanitarian trap. People are actually incentivized to take more risks, and the, the traffickers now take away the, uh, the, the, the motor, the engine, and let, let people just adrift. And, and people accept that because they think, yeah, we will be picked up, and sometimes they are not. And so since 2015, the figure that I uh, quoted has gone up. Uh, 10 times uh, because of that. And, and it's difficult to have that conversation in public because you will always have someone uh, who will say, you know, sort of the blackmail argument, do you want us to let people drown in the Mediterranean? And I have to answer, do you want us to give them a humanitarian guarantee so more people will drown? So you get into the, you know, into this sort of conversation. Yes. Uh, I remember reading that that the whole continent of South Africa, of Africa functioned on a slave economy for centuries, even into the 20th century. And I wonder if you could comment a little bit on the, the history of, of, with regard to that and how long that notion or that structure existed, whether any of it still exists today. Uh, I'm glad you raised South Africa. I, I don't think that uh, I have no knowledge whatsoever about a slave economy. When I, I, uh, the only thing I could think of is the, 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 the you know the migratory economy that uh, through mining was uh, incentivized by by the apartheid regime. Um, but South Africa is a is a case in point because I think we ruined the chances of post-apartheid South Africa for a future because Mandela's uh, historical compromise was predicated on the fact that you would have a healing of the of the wounds of apartheid which would seal the borders in the sense that the wealthy people that you can actually tax to redress the you know the the consequences of apartheid and uplift people who were underprivileged before you needed to make sure that these people don't run away and they run away today to the anti-apartheid allies canada australia the united states all the doctors the lawyers or the the nurses and they do run away for uh, so the, half of the the assumption was that you would seal the borders from within 
through mm -hmm. goodwill. But this goodwill is being called into question by the so-called born freeze, people who were born after the end of apartheid. Now that's roughly 40% of the population in South Africa. And they feel that the historical compromise didn't give them economic empowerment. And so white people are fleeing South Africa, mostly wealthy people. And at the same time, there was a, a massive influx, which also shielded Europe from uh, migration, a massive influx of sub-Saharan Africans coming to post-apartheid South Africa. And so we actually have ruined the, the South African economy. Uh, not we have ruined. The South African economy was ruined by migration, both by the outward migration, because the historical compromise by Mandela, I don't know whether that was sustainable, the right policy, that's a different discussion, but it is not no longer endorsed by uh, the South African youth, a majority, they call it into question, that leads to people fleeing the country, and at the same time you have a massive influx of millions of people who come from the Congo and uh, Zimbabwe when it went through the crisis uh, uh, until the, you know, still to down to the present day, but the end of Mugabe, and you have millions of people getting into South Africa in an uncontrolled way, and, and uh, the, the economic model is breaking down. Now, I also want to say a word, even though that's really very delicate, but it's uh, in the sense of that it's another of the questions. Slave and slave economy, I don't know anything about it regarding South Africa, but what I know is that historically Africa's problem, Sub-Saharan Africa's problem was to put to productive employment its population. It's an underpopulated part of the world uh, where wealth in people was much more important than uh, land tenure, so having a, a land title. Communal land ownership was the rule, and uh, the, the accent put on, on kinship is due to the fact that wealth in people is so strategically important, very different from Europe in this regard. And now when you look at the servile conditions, slave, slavery was abolished in Mauritania in 1980. Slavery was pervasive in Africa, uh, and many of my students at Duke, I don't know how it is here, when I come into an intro class and say, what's the relationship between colonialism and slavery? They say, colonialism is slavery. And I, I, I try to teach them, well, colonialism, at, at least at a doctrinal level, was anti-slavery, and the servile condition was prevalent in Africa and still is a very, very strong structuring element of relations, uh, relationships in, in, in Africa because the because of the, the aftermath of, of uh, slavery. The domestic slave, and this is the touchy part of it, uh, slave trades are part of this uh, process of Africa trying to put to productive employment their scarce population. And I'm afraid that, that to some extent the mass migration is another rent-seeking attempt to let people leave so that you would get the remittances, as well, I'm now obviously uh, putting logic into, into states, which I should not, but uh, to get both the remittances and to have um, the, uh, the migratory rent that you could get from the north as another incentive for a population policy that I, I think is as infamous as the servile condition was and slave trades were before. But this is a, a, a field of research, a field of debate that, to my knowledge, no one has yet ventured into. I'm saying this correctly. You're saying that <clears throat> your view is that slavery is still going on now? No, slavery goes on in some, some parts of, uh, <coughs> of Africa in the sense that you still have a, a domestic slave. That, but that's, uh, that's not... What I mean is to say, if you look at the fundamentals of uh, deep African, the long durée, so as to speak, uh, the wealth in, uh, in people as a contrast to uh, the uh, importance of territory, of land and land ownership in, in Europe, you have a management of the population which has derailed in many circumstances. Slavery, the slave condition was, the, was one major accident. The next wreck is, uh, and the big one is the is slave trades, which is a, uh, a joint venture by slave traders and slave providers. Only 3% of the slaves that were sold were captured by by outsiders, the rest were delivered, and so you have that economy. And I think you have today migration as another ambivalent uh, historical accident if, if, if it is not addressed properly, because there's so much interest in just having it, uh, you know, uh, letting go on. 
uh, in the context of a very criminalized uh, way of managing the, the exodus of people. But this, I have never read any article about it. I have not published about it. Uh, uh, this is really uncharted territory. I'm just pointing into that direction. You made a, um, a brief reference to race. Yeah. Uh, but um, uh, Africans look different. So how much does that matter? And um, I suppose uh, what, what's called racism can, can be in blacks as well as in whites, but um, what and how, how much? Uh, yeah, how much does that matter? Um, I'm not sure. I'm really very competent because I rediscovered American race conception only when I came back after many years spent abroad, and I'm still sometimes uh, baffled. Uh, I feel myself a little bit closer to the African way of seeing race, which is more of a cluster. So people would call me a white man, but that means the color of my skin. It means the fact that I probably moralize more than I should or try to lecture them, uh, that I can have a ticket to go back to the rich place where I come from. It's a lot of things. It's not just uh, skin color and, and, uh, uh, and the fetishize, you know, sort of fetishization of, of skin color. Uh, I, I think there is dominion, there is uh, hegemony. The uh, manumission slaves that uh, the United States sent back to the Pepper Coast, which we now call Liberia, led to a regime that broke only down in 1980 of domination of black people dominating other people. But they didn't dominate them in with a sort of racial hege hegemony. They had their masonry, they had other ways of saying we are different, they called themselves Congo, the, the, the motive of the national motto was uh, uh, the love of liber liberty brought us here, which obviously wasn't true for the majority of the population who had been there all the time. So you, have, you can have black on black dom uh, domination, but it is not in racial terms. No one would say, you would, I, I felt that a Congo with a native Liberian in the same room would create or gender in general the same tension that you would feel you know in apartheid South Africa but it was not racial it was much more this cluster of uh, of hegemony over other people what about like East Africans versus West Africans Somalis or Somali friends are you know kind of racist toward West Africans and that's just I, 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 I understand what you're but I think this is more stereotypes and it is uh, you you can say it's foreigners and the unknown uh, I found Somalis wonderfully racist with uh, toward me because they they, they they think you are half of a man and you can spend so you could in Somalia spend days and afternoons with their women and with their girls etc because you were you know minor minor issue uh, they are so full of themselves they have a, a complex of superiority uh, and for some good reason I think uh, so you have a lot of these these sort of prejudices but I don't would I wouldn't call them racist uh, Somalis played a, a big role in Kenya in colonial Kenya and they were usually the foremen etc so they have this complex of superiority and like many uh, warrior tribes so as to speak uh, they, they condescend, but it is not, they don't say any uh, racial slurs against other people uh, in specifically referring to their, you know, to the way they look. So it's very different from, from what we call race here, I think. Professor Rosen. Uh, thank you for a wonderful talk, from which I learned a great deal. Uh, from the talk and the questions, you, you provided a, a long and persuasive list of all the factors that will continue to sustain or maybe increase migration from Sub-Saharan Africa to Europe. And you said that uh, a fortress Europe is not sustainable and that the, sort of the best that we could hope for is muddling through. Yes. If that happens in the period that you're interested in studying, 2030, what will be the proportion of sub-Saharan sub Africans living in France? Oh. <laughs> Sometimes I regret that I ever uh, broached the question because a journalist reading a book will sort of leap at this paragraph and forget about the rest of the book. So you have to be very uh, careful and also you're not standing on firm ground. What I can say and did say is now only 30% of um, African migrants actually migrate outside of Africa. 15% go to Europe. 
I don't know, within Europe, the, uh, what you could call the sort of colonial attractiveness is wilting, is going away. People make uh, decisions while migrating. Where are the opportunities? So people don't go necessarily to France or Belgium because they're Francophones any longer. Uh, they may go to Italy or they may find that Germany is very attractive for other reasons or it's much easier to get a, an entry-level job in, in Great Britain. That's the reason why they were on that side of the channel trying to get away from Calais and the French complained about those them being around, they actually wanted to go to the other side. So uh, I'm not sure whether the, the flow of people will still follow the, the patterns that we think. Usually it, it began with post-colonial uh, uh, migration. And the role of diasporas is very, uh, very important because they open first possibilities, they are welcoming people and give them a first chance. So people tend to migrate where already people from their community are. So all that makes it very, very complicated to predict. What I can say is that in the 1950s, nine out of 10 Africans migrating would migrate on the continent. So the proportion is going up and the total numbers are going up. We will move from 1.3 billion to 2.4 billion and perhaps we will move to five to five, so 50% going abroad. More and more people are also coming to the United States. Uh, the smartest, uh, who may I say, but very smart African migrants come to the United States. They fly to Central America. Sometimes there is no visa uh, obligation. And then they come through the southern border. Over the period of 2000 to 2010, more than 400,000 Sub-Saharan Africans, which is not big for our country, but it means more people than over the three centuries of slave trade came to uh, America over the decade between 2000 and 2010. Wow. So the pressure on the rest of the world uh, of Sub-Saharan Africa will go up. Will they continue to go to Europe? What parts of Europe? Why do Somalis go to Sweden? you know, in the first place. Uh, so, so all these questions are really very open and I, I'm, I'm not on firm ground to answer your question. But I will say one thing. When you think about that, the most cos cosmopolitan place in the world in 1950, London, you had in all of Great Britain 25,000 people of color. I hate the expression, but they lump everything together and so it's that. And obviously, if you think about Great Britain and London today, when you think that was in 1950, roughly when I was born, we have, you know, uh, Af Africa and Europe have changed tremendously over 60 years. And if you project that into the future, I don't know under what conditions, but the Africanization, I use the word not to scaremonger, that's just a fact. And the Africanization of Europe will continue. I don't think that's a problem if the Africans come to become Europeans, unless you're a racist and you can't think about a black European, there is for me no problem. The problem is if people come and want to set up a diaspora and indulge in politics of resentment shortcut, then it becomes more problematic. I understand why you want to be very careful how you approach the subject. Uh, on the other hand, it's... Uh, you clearly indicate that you think the proportion of people living in West Europe of sub-Saharan origin will go up. It's very significantly, I didn't want to evade the question. Think about ourselves. Mm -hmm. uh, between 1975 and 2010, um, 10 million Mexicans came to the United States. And now flows, uh, the, 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 the flow is negative, yes. notwithstanding what some people say. And um, we now have 30 million Mexican-Americans in the United States, which is roughly a little bit less than 10% of the population. This is tiny by comparison to Europe. If uh, some, some you know, models predict 150 million uh, people of Sub-Saharan, of uh, African, not Sub-Saharan, African, so North Africa included, because you already have big diaspora communities, uh, something like 150 million uh, people of African origin in Europe in, uh, in 2050. Uh, but that's obviously, uh, that means of 500 million, because normally Europe would stay roughly constant, given the, the fertility rates. That, that's some models. I, I can't tell you whether that is realistic or not, but that gives you an order of magnitude. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so the water crisis in uh, the water problem in Africa, mm -hmm. 
the access to of water to uh, for the poor. Uh, the question is very often which part of Africa, uh, so in tropical Africa, not such a big problem. And the question is more the access to clean water. Uh, you know, when you're living in a Lagos slum, uh, you have access to water, but it's a uh, cloaca. You know, it's basically the, the lagoon. Uh, and and so uh, I'm not a specialist on that question, but I know that the disparity, the, the variety of situations, is huge. Uh, and, and so I'm, I'm hesitant to generalize for Africa. I don't think access to water is a problem in all of, sub in, in all of tropical Africa, definitely in the Sahel region, and uh, probably also in North Africa and in the Horn of Africa. But uh, beyond that, I would be uncomfortable to answer your question. Yeah. Can I? Yes, please. Uh, yeah. um, thanks for your talk. Uh, you mentioned something about uh, governments uh, in Africa being paid by Europeans to keep their population yeah. at home, or uh, you know, at least in Africa. Uh, can you give an example of some country that's doing that? or And do you consider that kind of arrangement to be potentially effective? Or do you, do you consider that to be another aspect of Fortress Europe that you think is unsustainable? Or is that an alternative to Fortress Europe? I know Trump is trying to do something like that with Mexico, or he is doing it. I hadn't heard much about the European countries doing it. Um, you know. Yeah. For more detail, there is a not so positive review of my book in the London Review of Books that just came out. And the person, Thomas Meany, was more interested, he doesn't say negative things about the book, but he's actually taking the book a little bit like uh, a, a pretext to uh, investigate the question himself. So he travels to Niger. And he is, I think there is a reproach that he thinks I didn't take that seriously enough and it's a scandal and I should have been much more vocal about it. So you will get more detail, but I give you some. Uh, so historically, uh, the Libyan dictator did blackmail Europe, saying, uh, unless you pay me 3 billion euros, I will unleash migrants, and uh, the face of uh, Europe will be changed. That's a quote by Gaddafi. And this is going on, and Europe has struck deals. The, most, the best known is with Turkey, and that's more refugees. And now we see how the Turks sort of managed that with regard to Syria. I will not go. Six billion euros were given to the to to Turkey, uh, a little bit under under German guidance, if I can put it that way, because they're most concerned. Uh, but Europe has negotiated also uh, with uh, Sudan, uh, Khartoum, not South Sudan, and is working with people who are sometimes involved in uh, Janjaweed activities. The so people we accused of genocide in Darfur. So uh, we are not, I mean, Europeans are not very regarding when it comes to with whom negotiate. And it is very often also privileges for the elite. So you would get uh, for a number of people uh, long-term access to Europe, so multiple entry visas in exchange of, you know, of help in policing. And this is all the Rimland uh, through the Sahel. So I mentioned the, the center in Agadez where actually European officials are managing the, the, the refugees on the ground. And the idea is the, the forward defense. What I, 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 you know, whatever we think about it politically, what I don't like about it is if you can't control what you do to the refugees and what is done uh, to the refugees by third parties, you end up like the CIA using some countries for torturing other people. And, and, and I think if you, want to, uh, if you want to regulate flows, you have to do it on your ground and on your own conditions and under the, uh, under the scrutiny of your own population and not outsource it or you know, so, sort of sell it out for tender to, uh, to third uh, countries that you don't control and perhaps don't want to control, so they would do things uh, that uh, benefit your, your interest, but uh, things that you weren't, you're not prepared to do yourself. And it's going all around the Mediterranean. The Algerians are complaining about the fact that only 3% of, of the migrants that come to Europe 
uh, originate from their soil, even though they have hundreds of thousands of sub-Saharan migrants on their territory, and they police it very tightly, uh, but they are complaining about the fact that they don't get anything out of it, whereas money is given to Morocco, et cetera, et cetera because you also have these two uh, territories, Spanish territories, on Moroccan soil, and uh, I discussed the Moroccan position, which is very original already uh, previously. But there is a lot of detail about that because it is, in, at least in, in a certain political reading, it's a, it's a, it's a scandal. Martha, sure. this last question. Uh, we've, we've mentioned race. Why not religion? Mm -hmm. um, the a large uh, percentage of those crossing our southern border are Christian, mm -hmm. and some significant percentage of those uh, crossing from Africa into Europe are Muslim. Does that matter? Yes. And uh, just to share with you, I went in, I mean, must be now almost two years ago, uh, there was a European summit meeting, and so all people who were involved in migratory issues were free because, uh, you know, when the leaders were meeting, they, they, they had free time. And so we sat together in a room like this, 50 people perhaps, and uh, uh, we discussed, and it was really interesting, and any prejudice that I could have had about European bureaucrats was you know, at least evaporated or somehow diminished. But uh, it went so nicely that at the end, someone very honest said, I need to tell you in front of everybody that we have never published a paper about migration with the word Islam in it. And then I, my, all my prejudice came back. Uh, because this is, you know, I, I'm not Islamophobic, and, uh, uh, but you can't discuss uh, migration to Europe without ever addressing the question of Islam. But Islam is not the only question. Uh, I give you the example of France. There is no Pentecostal uh, community in France traditionally now, but now you have a very strong born-again uh, presence in the outskirts of big cities coming also from sub-Saharan Africa because the people who are not Muslim are very often Pentecostal, and they are Pentecostal, by the way, because they are looking to, for a rebirth in protest against or in, in rupture with the African tradition that I spoke about, uh, this is a sort of renewal. And now all of a sudden uh, France discovers that they have, in addition to what they were obsessed about, which was Muslim population, and which matters, which I don't want to talk away, but they had totally overlooked the fact that they also now have hundreds of thousands and perhaps more than a million of born-again Christians that they didn't even know what that was in a, traditional, in a country that traditionally was Catholic with 5% uh, of Protestants and a small Jewish community. So it matters very much. And obviously, questions of lifestyle, how you look at authority, but it's not a monopoly of, of Muslim populations. I mean, uh, the, the way sub-Saharan, all the cultural legacy that you bring uh, the, the, the way you look at authority, it's not always negative, you know, if people have more respect for elderly people, I grow into that category, I would welcome that. But, uh, you know, there's, it's, it's a mix. And do as if, it, as if there were a universal person that goes from one part of the world into another, and you just replace the local by outsiders who become local by the mere fact of just arriving there is absurd. Thank you with that word, and, uh, <laughs> and this has been very eye-opening and quite wonderful. Thank you.